Good evening, friends. Welcome to the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District Board of Education's meeting for October 18th. Let the record show that all members of the Board of Education are present this evening and that we called this meeting to order this afternoon at 4.30 p.m. where we made our way into closed session. There's one item we'd like to report out of our closed session and I'll read it and it is as follows. The board approved a settlement agreement with ACI Contractors Inc. concerning the track and field replacement project at Lincoln Middle School. Under the terms of the settlement, ACI agreed to pay the district $145,000 for delays to completion of the project and $16,380 for incomplete work, which will offset ACI's claims of $126,932.20 for additional work. The settlement will result in a net payment to the district by ACI of $34,447.80. That was a unanimous decision by the Board of Education. Um, we now return to um, the public setting and we will be led tonight in the Pledge of Allegiance by Asha Hudson, who is one of our fifth grade students at Edison Elementary. Welcome, Asha. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. That now brings us, friends, to the approval of tonight's agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Moved by Oscar, thank you, sir. Seconded by Craig. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Sarah, that's a unanimous decision to approve tonight's agenda. That brings us to approval of the minutes. And we have one set of minutes dating from October 4th. And are there corrections? Are d All right, so it's moved by Craig, seconded by Oscar. All in favor of approving the minutes for October 4th, 2018, say aye. aye. And that is also unanimous. Dr. Drady, that now brings us to our Board of Education commendations and recognitions tonight. And we're um, pleased to, be see, to see that we are um, having a presentation on National Hispanic Latino Heritage Month. So I will call on Dr. Jacqueline Mora to introduce the, the speaker. Thank you. So good evening, it is a pleasure for me to welcome our students and staff from Edison Elementary who have prepared a very special presentation for us this evening. So at this moment I would like to introduce our principal, Ms. Lori Oram, to come forward and, and to introduce and begin the discussion. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, there we go. Let me introduce Elizabeth Di Pina from our school. She's our interventionist teacher. And Mr. Ruben Marquez, who is uh, filling in for us on a long-term sub as a third grade teacher. And we have a lot of our children here tonight and our families. And I'm wondering if we wanna have our children take their spots up here in front. So we have some things to share with you tonight in a little PowerPoint presentation and our topic was supposed to be National Hispanic Heritage Month, which we often don't refer to as National Hispanic Heritage Month um, because we try to use the terms that people use to identify themselves. And it's not really a month. We do this all year long at Edison, but we're here to share with you our approach to doing this. You know, we're the immersion school in the district and just a reminder that we are there are three things in our mission. One is building proficiency in English and Spanish for all of our students. The other is to teach for high academic achievement in all other content areas 
and the third pillar which we're talking about tonight which is developing students sociocultural competence that's a key tenet of immersion so just to okay let me see I have to do teacher voice or microphone voice <laughs> um, <laughs> just to give you a little bit of context about our school in terms of race and ethnicity we're about almost 80% Hispanic according to what the families, how they identify themselves. Maybe about 20% white and then a small percentage of 3% African American and 2% Asian. However, I'd like to point out that we do have a lot of families that are of mixed race and mixed ethnicity. So this isn't exactly representative, but according to the parameters for reporting, this is what um, our data shows. In addition, I'd like to talk about the language classifications. We have um, a little less than half, or I'd say 40% of our students are English-only students, and 60% of our students are students that speak a second language. Of those that speak a second language, um, about a third are English learners. Another 25% are bilinguals, so they actually come into the school speaking both English and Spanish. And then we have a small percentage of students that are classified, that are reclassified, and that's not because that students are not developing their English at Edison, but it's because they usually get to that point in fifth grade and then they are reclassified and that will show up in the middle school data. So it looks small here, but a lot of our students reclassify when they leave us. And I also wanted to point out the different languages we have at Edison. Obviously, we have a strong Spanish-speaking population, but we do have a sprinkling of other languages as well. We have German, Japanese, Amharic, which is um, an Ethiopian language, Portuguese, and Russian. And despite the fact that we have uh, a majority of Spanish speakers, we do honor and like all of our students to feel proud of their heritage. And although we're talking about Hispanic heritage, we do value all the different languages and heritages and cultures at our school. So we have a lens that we use when we try to develop children's sociocultural competence and we focus on the cultures of the Americas and the plural is intentional, the many cultures in our hemisphere from the Antarctic to Tierra del Fuego. And we have a beyond heroes and holidays approach to teaching about these things. It embeds learning about identity and diversity right into the curriculum. And we are guided by the social justice anchor standards on identity and diversity. Um, we appreciate so much that you all approved those for the district. So um, I just wanted to remind you, I know you all are familiar with the um, social justice standards. You approved them and we're so glad you did. Um, today we're going to focus on the standards for identity and diversity, and um, I w if you, I'm not going to read them all, but while you're watching what we do, you're going to see how these standards resonate in the work that we're doing at Edison. And this is nothing new for us. This actually is how we've always worked, but, but having standards has given us an opportunity to dig deeper and to be able to be more conscious of the work that we do, and so we really appreciate this, these as guiding, a guiding tool. So we wanted to share with you a little bit about how Edison uses National Hispanic Heritage Month to build identity and diversity with our students. And as I mentioned, we embed the social justice, identity, and diversity standards in what we do. This is what we teach all year. It's not limited to a month. And we start doing this by using the terms that people use to refer to themselves. So whether it's you know Latino, Hispano, Guatemalan, Russian, whatever it is people use to refer to themselves, that's the terminology we use. We use their native languages whenever possible, and we try to be inclusive of all the cultures that are within our community. And it affects everything we do. So we embed it from the literature that we choose to teach, the multiple perspectives on the content we teach, the topics that we use to create theater, the kinds of songs we teach kids and where that music comes from, and even how we structure our work in our edible garden. 
So I'd like to point out an example of how we integrate the social justice standards of identity and diversity in our work, specifically with the Hispanic um, culture. So we have, um, we're very fortunate to have a theater program um, because of PS Arts, thank you, the Ed Foundation. And um, it's, it's offered entirely in Spanish. So our students from TK to fifth grade will do theater in Spanish. This fall, our fourth graders are starting work on their bilingual play, which is the untold history of California, including Toy Purina, Joaquin Murieta, and the farm workers. And we also have our third graders who are working on a piece for Dia de los Muertos in English, Spanish, and Nahuatl, which is something you're going to see later. Um, we also integrate um, our work in music. We have a Spanish choral music in addition to the district's music program. Students learn and perform a variety of songs from throughout Latin America, not just Mexico, but all of Latin America. And we have week, it's weekly for our pre-K up to second grade students. And then we also have an after school program for our third through fifth grade students. So I wasn't kidding when I say it affects the edible garden even. Even the plants we grow in the school's garden are part of purposeful teaching about identity and diversity. So right now we're growing sempasuchil flowers for our Day of the Dead altars. The other word is big marigolds. Um, and we do three sisters plantings. We grow amaranth, which was a staple in the Aztec diet. We grow cilantro and epazote and tomatoes and chile to teach about indigenous diet, but it's also what we eat today. We also have integrated uh, art culture and art and culture into our social emotional learning. This has been something that's very important to us. And so we had our theater teacher who was also an artist created this labyrinth in, that is in the design of a Mayan butterfly. And students are able to walk the labyrinth in order to calm themselves and to find their center and to um, create focus. And in we also embed art and culture and science and social justice. So this little piece, it's not a little piece, it's a huge piece. It's a triptych, three panels that wrap around a pole. And it's called Mariposas Sin Fronteras, or Butterflies Without Borders. And it came about with our fourth and fifth graders because they were having a figure drawing lesson from our PS Arts teacher. At the same time, they were studying about the monarch migration back and forth between the United States and Michoacan, Mexico. And one of the children made a comment and said, oh, I wish we were like the butterflies. Then we could just fly across the borders like they do. And that morphed into an art project. And there you see the children as butterflies flying over the oceans and flying over the cities. And it's done to recognize and honor the migrant experience that's shared by many of our students. So a new project that we are embarking on this year is a community project called Escuchamos para Aprender. And it's actually also a language development project. So we have our fifth graders are interviewing community elders in Spanish on the weekends and they're documenting their histories and memories of the Pico neighborhood. And we're having a listening party in December in case you're interested in coming. And the social justice standards also guide the work that we do with our parents. So this is some of the most fun things to do because we actually have a parent and family singing circle. Meets every Friday morning. If you're interested, it's a great way to start your Friday morning. And we sing in Spanish. And we learn language in Spanish with each other. It's very non-threatening. And we learn songs from all over Latin America. And then the parents perform them along with the after-school children's chorus at school events. So there's a picture of some of our parents and students on one of our murals at an event. We also listened to the community and something that came out of our parent group was that they wanted to have cultural tables where they could set up a table that represents the culture that they come from in the morning on Wednesdays when we have cafecito and the families gather around and they wanted to be able to display things from their culture. So this is completely run by the parents, was something that they wanted to do, and we have had many different cultures represented that are representative of our school. 
Our PTA also does some really interesting work. <laughs> they sponsor community dialogues, what are, which are specifically facilitated 10 sessions to um, promote discussion and dialogue about identity, what we have in common, that we have more in common than we don't. And in a very diverse community like ours, it's really h important to be intentional about building community across different lines. And in addition, they have a project they call Intercambios, and people sign up if they would like to be partnered with another person to practice their emergent language skills. So you have people who are shy about practicing their English and people who are shy about practicing their Spanish. They're paired up, they go have coffee, they meet as often as they want to practice their language and get to know somebody else. So as we mentioned, we do, we do this work all year but we do have a few activities that are unique that we do during the month or the time around Hispanic Heritage Month, so we'd like to highlight some of those activities. This is our famous uh, TKK Tostada Party and Dias de Independencia celebration, and we celebrate all the days of independence in Latin American countries. What we have in common in our hemisphere is that we all had the colonial experience, and so we all had the Independence Day experience. So kids can dress up in native and uh, costume if they like, or a typical dress. Everybody signs up and brings something for a tostada, and we have a huge potluck. The kids learn to dance, they teach it to their parents, and we all party. And speaking of party, <laughs> no, we also um, are, we have assemblies during the, the month of Hispanic Heritage, and this month we are going to be having a mariachi assembly and this is particularly interesting because upcoming, thank you to the district music program, we are going to be hosting at Edison a um, youth mariachi orchestra starting in January. So we're very excited about that. And this is going to help launch that with our students and build excitement. We do a fall science project of the study of the migration of the monarch butterflies. It's a, a citizen science project called the Journey North where the kids actually track the migration of the butterflies happening every year. They go from North America down to Michoacan, they winter in Michoacan, and they come back. So we learn a lot about the science of that. How on earth do butterflies do that when they've never been there before? And we learn a lot about the children in rural Michoacan. And so we will often send them symbolic butterflies from Santa Monica. We make our art and we write them letters and tell them what it's like to live in Santa Monica, send them along, and then the children write back to us with pictures from the butterfly reserve in Michoacan. So one of the most known and exciting and look forward to event that we have at Edison is our Festival del Dia de los Muertos. So every fall when other schools are having their fall festival, we have a fall festival with a little bit of a twist. Um, this, what we do is we have, in case you're not familiar with the, of the um, holiday Dia de los Muertos, it's actually a pre-Columbian tradition. And um, in that tradition, the people believe that they're the ones that had passed come back to visit each year in November, November 1st and 2nd, which is ironically the same time around when the butterflies visit and they believe the butterflies are spirits. So there might be a tie in there. And so what they do is they set up altars in their homes that honor those that have passed and to welcome them into their home. So they'll put up pictures, they'll put up, they'll put food and different things that that person liked, flowers, the, which are the marigold that you're gonna see, and they set that up in their home. They also visit the cemeteries and, and have celebrations there as well. So at Edison, what we do is we explore this universal human experience of loss and death because we know that's something that we all experience, and we do it through the lens of the cultures of Mexico and Central America. We also ask families to share the ways their cultures of origin remember and honor the departed. So we want the, st the students to also go back to their own families and ask them about what do we do? What does our family do for this? So that they can make a connection between what others do and what they do. And we brought, we have a sample in the, your packet of some, f it was a fourth grade assignment to ask their um, parents, what do we do when someone is passed? What is our tradition? So you can look at that a little bit later, but you'll notice that you'll, we have answers in different languages and they're very diverse what, what um, the families say. 
So we really like to make sure we're honoring everyone. In addition, what we do, and this is the big display, if you come to Edison, we create classroom um, altars or ofrendas with our, which have pictures of the dearly departed. At this age, some of the children's dearly departed are grandparents or pets, and they put them up, and we create a beautiful, almost gallery in our cafeteria with all the different classroom altars. Um, in addition, we create, you'll see a picture of that, the alfombra de acerin, which is a sawdust carpet and a temporary piece of art similar to the Indian sand mandalas. All of this can be seen at our festival. So here are just a couple pictures of what it looks like when you walk through the altars. It has sound, smell, visuals, everything is very unique, a great experience if you haven't been there before. And we have student art, each classroom's altar is different, and it's different every year. So you guys have been so patient. I am so impressed. We bought some of our third grade children from Mr. Marcus's class, and they have been working on this presentation in Spanish and English and in Nahuatl. Their theater teacher, Marta Ramirez, is teaching a class on Day of the Dead ritual at UCLA tonight and couldn't be with us. But Mr. Mark has really jumped into the fray and picked up the slack, and he's got a little bit of this to share with you. And by the way, we're gonna, this is just a short presentation because the actual presentation is like three times as long. Uh, so we're just going to show the beginning and the end of the presentation.
was wonderful, boys and girls. Thank you, and thank you, board, for your attention and indulgence as we shared that with you. Um, last thing is just an invitation. Uh, if you're around next uh, Friday night, November 2nd, we do a little reception for the altars. It's a beautiful little evening. We serve pan dulce, chocolate. We would love to see any of you who can come. And then the next day is our Festival de Dia de los Muertos all afternoon on Saturday. Shameless plug. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Could we get a picture? Is Gail here tonight? Or no, I took some pictures for her to see. Can we get a picture with the board? Yeah. In the, in the, oh, if it's okay? Sure. Do you want us to go with over there? Or? They were very good. Oscar, yes. yes. Uh, muchas gracias, padres de Edison. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, parents, for bringing your children and teachers and staff. Gracias. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, friends, and that brings us to the superintendent's report. Dr. Drotty? On a couple of um, items I would like to talk about, uh, today we um, had a district-wide um, practice with our, our earthquake grills, and um, it gave us an opportunity to, uh, for the district and the sites to initiate their uh, protocols for emergency response. Uh, so we had the EOC active, while the, the sites also had their uh, command centers open. Um, I was really proud of the schools and the staff and how they handled that situation. I mean, it, it was a fictitious drill, but, uh, the, but everyone really took, uh, took, the, took it very seriously and um, were actually um, paying close attention. And I thought we learned a lot. I, know I learned a lot being the incident commander. So, so anytime we get an opportunity to, uh, to practice these drills, uh, it's, an, it's an important thing. In that vein, in that vein we uh, just want uh, to uh, also announce um, uh, the, the situation with the power outage we had this past week. Um, there was a power outage um, that hit Santa Monica and Ma Malibu, but particularly Malibu very hard. So we, we, they were out of power for almost a, um, a full day. And we weren't really sure if we were gonna open school the next day. Um, I wanna give a shout out to the city of Malibu for really working with us to figure out what the situation is. Uh, the communication became an issue. That is something that we're gonna have to look into uh, as these uh, power editors may be a reality in the future. Uh, but um, that is an area we learned that anytime there's a power outage, the communication is a, is a struggle. Uh, but the staffs at Malibu High School, Ma uh, Webster, Cabrillo, and Point Doom handled it very well. Uh, as designed, the way our emergency, emergency operations work, uh, we expect that each site to be able to function while we support. And the fact that they were able to coordinate their services and communicate with us was, uh, was, was excellent. Um, a couple of uh, trainings that are taking place that are pretty exciting that I think is, is worth noting. We have about 14 teachers that have volunteered 
uh, their time to learn about uh, project-based learning. And there's a lot of activities we have planned uh, throughout the year. But the first institute they're going through is called the Bucks Institute. Uh, it's a, they're the leading organization that really teaches teachers how to um, design lessons uh, throughout the year, uh, which are project-based. So when those, when those days are solidified, I'll send the invite to you guys to see if you guys, you guys want to attend. But it's some powerful training, and I'm really, really glad we have some fired up teachers that want to learn more about project-based learning. And, um, and then also a reminder, uh, we have two cohorts uh, learning about the social justice standards. Uh, the, the, the cohort from last year, the first cohort, is in the process to continue to develop their lessons while we are actually um, initiated a new cohort. So we have two cohorts going on at the same time. And, and that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Jardy. I have a clarifying question for you. Um, you mentioned that the 14 teachers are volunteering, but I hope they're receiving a stipend. Oh, yes, yes. Um, what I meant by volunteering, yeah, we, we would never, <laughs> we would never uh, treat students and uh, our staff in a way that we wouldn't honor them for their work. What I meant volunteering is not a, it's not a mandatory thing. Uh, we put an ask out there knowing that this is a, a great opportunity and a lot of them jump to it. We actually think we're going to get more uh, in, in the near future, so I'll, I'll keep you posted on that. Thank you. I knew your answer. I just wanted to make sure that you spoke, uh, that you would speak that. Thank you. Um, colleagues, that brings us now to the consent calendar. Um, I'm going to ask that we pull item 6A1 as it's um, a contract with Santa Monica College, and I'm an employee there, and I believe that two of them, excuse me, 6A1, 6A1 will cover both of those, and I believe that Maria also. Okay, so the rest is moved by Craig Foster, seconded by Lori Lieberman. So uh, if there's any discussion on all those items, absent of the 6A1. Seeing that there's not, we will move to our advisory vote. Welcome. All in favor? Thank you. Mr. Metcher? Yes. Ms. Leon Vasquez? Yes. Ms. Lieberman? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Mr. De La Torre? Yes. Mr. Keene? Yes. And I'm a yes. And so on the consent calendar, Sarah, everything minus 6A1 is a unanimous decision from the Board of Education. That now brings item 6A1 from the consent calendar forward. Is there a motion? Moved by John King, seconded by Craig Foster. Is there any discussion? And I would like to let our student board member know that student board members can make motions, just simply cannot vote. Advisory vote only. You fixed the chair, thank you, Craig. You also raise the chair. And it is, uh, yes, please. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you. Oh. There you go. When the light's on, you know that you are uh, on a hot mic. Okay. Yes. Great. Mr. Metcher? Yes. Ms. Leon Vasquez? Abstention. Ms. Lieberman? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Mr. De La Torre? Yes. Mr. King? Yes. And I am an abstention. So, Sarah, that's five eyes and two abstentions, no no's. Thank you very much. Now that brings us to our study session for the evening. Dr. Drotty. I would like to bring up Dr. Jacqueline Mora to introduce uh, the program. Good evening, board president, uh, members of the board, Dr. Drotty, cabinet and guests. It is a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Mr. Tom Whaley, our visual and performing arts coordinator to discuss this item. This item is an example of our efforts to incorporate various genres into our existing program, and we're really excited to be here this evening to share with you our work. Tom. Hello. Welcome. Good evening, Dr. Drotti and board members. It's a pleasure to be here, and as Dr. Mora said, this is an exciting time. We're all, I think many of us are gonna be very happy to hear what I'm gonna be discussing tonight. Uh, Sarah, just the, the button on the right, I'm assuming, advances. Good, that works for me. So uh, let's talk about mariachi. 2019, we're going to be starting a mariachi program in the district. And I'm going to give an overview as to a little bit of history where we, how we've tried in the past, it didn't quite happen, and what we're doing now that's different, and why this is important and all that. So uh, the, the first class will be held on Tuesday, January 8th, 2019 at Edison Elementary and with an after-school program. It's a pilot 
only fifth graders in Santa Monica will be involved with the pilot. I wanted to thank uh, Lori Oram, who we just heard from, from Edison Language Academy, who's just uh, a very uh, amazing colleague to work with, and I want to appreci I appreciate you hosting this. Uh, and she's very excited, as I am. So uh, we're really excited to get this off the ground. And so we'll go through uh, the, the slide is I'm pushing the, there we go. Um, so the why, uh, these are, I was like, we have a great music program. Uh, last Friday I presented at UCLA about our uh, amazing music program. They asked us to talk about how did you do your elementary program? How can we be like your district? It was basically, it was really a great moment for us to talk about. But also in the discussion with all music supervisors in the state were there and we talked about all districts are doing similar work that what we're doing here or approaching, trying to find ways to be more culturally aware of our students and finding ways to connect with our students. So the why, shared values, student-centered. We make decisions and allocate resources with students first in mind. Equity, we meet our students where they are and provide the necessary resources and attention to make all students successful. Engagement, we engage students in a meaningful, rigorous, and rebel, relevant educational experience where they are inspired, supported, challenged, and motivated. And collaboration, we are stronger than we collaborate, dialogue, and listen to each other in a civil, productive way to improve outcomes for our students. Diversity, we respect and value our diverse student and staff population as an integral part of our learning community. And civility, we work in dialogue with each other in a respectful manner, setting the example for our students of how civil discourse learn leads to positive outcomes. This is all from our district website, and this is exactly all of these uh, lead to why we're doing this work. <clears throat> so I, I included in your packets a great article written by Marcia Neal. Uh, entitled Mariachi and Spanish-Speaking English Learners, District Initiatives, Models, and Education Policy. It's not a very long article, but I wanted to uh, just share these three quotes that I pulled. I thought these were pretty powerful quotes that I thought especially lean themselves to our, our work here. The impact of participating as an active music maker in any ensemble by any participant cannot be overlooked. But for Spanish-speaking English learners, the standards-based mariachi program provides a culturally familiar and welcoming setting, facilitates new patterns of learning, and addresses the, prior the priority of attaining English language proficiency. And then the next quote in his opening remarks for the 2014 White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics National Arts Forum at Pixar Studios, Richard Carranza, former SFUSD superintendent, told more than 150 invited national level decision makers that, quote, if you capture their interests, their intellect, commitment, their minds will follow. The White House Initiative on Educational Ex Excellence. So I mean, that quote stood out to me as, as why. I mean, students that may not be, English is not their, their home language, but this is something that the music may pull them to really feel like this is their space. And this is when, when, they, when they feel like someone cares about their background and their culture, then we'll have their, their minds. Principals also report that this increased activity continues to target the vision of helping parents, families, and local business and residential community to view the school as more relevant and culturally friendly. So um, the history of mariachi in our district. So in 2008, uh, you, there was a, uh, an attempt to start the mariachi program at Samo High, and that was a uh, not so, didn't go so well, because we were starting from the top, starting, and it was my, actually my initiative to just try to get something off the ground. Dr. Pedroza was the principal at the time, and we went room to room, uh, promoting mariachi and trying to get interest, and we just didn't have the interest. So um, then in 2018, 
Uh, we worked, we've been working with um, Marcia Neal, who we just heard from in that, that article, uh, is the executive of an organization called Music Education Consultants. We've been working with them, and we've had uh, five elementary music teachers attain, uh, attend a week-long training in Las Vegas during the summer, and they were so excited. Our teachers, our elementary teachers really had a blast. You'll see some photos in a minute. Uh, enjoying the, they were so excited about the new curriculum. And so now those teachers have been trained. And then we, I also created a three year strategic plan into the rollout of this mariachi program. And then in 2018 also, just now we're, we're ordering our guitars this week, uh, 20 guitars, but we're getting to all the instruments have been ordered for the, the launch of the Edison program. And so this is the implementation timeline. This is how it will work. So there's a letter that I've written that's in English and Spanish, obviously. It's going to be sent to all fifth graders in Santa Monica. And I'm meeting with the music teachers tomorrow, the elementary teachers, just to make sure we are, are distributing it in the best way possible they feel will, will be most effective. Usually it'll be a two-prong approach, Blackboard Connect, uh, at least two, a uh, hard copy in class, where the parents can sign up. They simply click on the link. They, my, my, name, my student's name is this uh, school I attend and uh, contact information. And then we will know how many teachers we'll need to be hiring for to, to make this happen. And Lori has <laughs> said, Tom, we're gonna, we're gonna give you the spaces, but she doesn't know exactly where, but we're gonna make it work together. But we're, we're hoping we have many, many students that want to take part in this. So this will be after school in the spring. And by the way, all leading up to this also, not in this timeline, is I met with all the music teachers in the district last year, and we talked about the rollout. And, and the, the music teachers requested this type of rollout to, to promote, recruit in the fall, and launch in the spring to make sure we have a solid start and everyone's aware. So we're also, you saw in the last Edison um, presentation, they are bringing a mariachi group on October 24th. We're going to be bringing a mariachi group at Edison as well on November 16th, where all the parents that have signed up will be invited to this evening, where they will be able to hear a mariachi performance, meet the performers, touch and feel the instruments, ask questions, and uh, that should uh, create a lot of excitement for everyone who attends. And then the first class will be January 8th. Um, the Mariachi PD will uh, begin for middle school because the next step is that in the fall, there will be a Mariachi program offered at John Adams starting in the fall at the middle school level for any student in grade six to eight that would like to partake. That will be happening in the fall. Um, and then that, I just said that, yeah, that's the red square. So here are some of our teachers in, in Las Vegas at the training. Um, they were, they were, there's some funny pictures. The, uh, the teacher down to the right there with the green coat on is Jarrell Garcia. And she was playing a guitaron in one of the pictures I received over the summer. And it was probably as big as her. It was, it was great. She was really excited. And so this is how more detail about the program. So th these are pieces from the three-year plan. But the first class is called Introduction to Mariachi. This is the class I've been talking about, the launch in the spring. It'll be at Edison, uh, 3.30 to 4.30. And, and this is all flex right now. We're, this is what we anticipate after talking with Marsha Neal. We anticipate this working. And we, as we move along, we might need to tweak some things, and we're ready to do that if we need to. But this is where we're going right now. And so this, this class is called Introduction to Mariachi. And the, uh, the notes are somehow not appearing to me, but anyway. It's essentially the, it, introducing, when the students arrive to the class, that is when they determine what instruments they want to play. Uh, originally, I had thought, my envision was that we would ask the students, out of the vihuela, guitaron, guitar, uh, trumpet, What's your interest? What would you like to sign up for? Uh, but after conferring with our teachers, we felt the best way possible is to have the kids 
um, come in and just start and then decide after trying all the instruments, I like this, I want to do this. Of course, all students in mariachi are encouraged to sing and most all sing and play an instrument. So they'll be both going on. <clears throat> and then at John Adams, there is um, beginning mariachi and it's split up into, I skipped a slide, there it is. Beginning mariachi is is going to be split up, that'll be starting in the fall, into two um, parts. Armonia, which is the har harmony instruments, guitaron, vihuela and guitar, th and also the melodia, which is the trumpet or vocals or sometimes violin. And so the, the way that we envision that happening is that there will be what we do in our, our current music program is we have sectionals. We have the violins go over here, the low, low strings or low brass woodwinds, and we do that. And that's going to be a similar model to this as well. And it will be one hour uh, after school a week for the beginning class, but then possibly more as we move on. And mariachi Ensemble 1 is the level after beginning. So if you imagine sixth graders, and this happens in our music program all the time, you might have a sixth grader that's ready to perform with the top mariachi groups in the world. You never, the, the levels of students are all over the place. So when we think all sixth graders will go to beginning, we can't think that way. We have to be flexible. So we'll have a mariachi ensemble one, and then also a mariachi, mariachi ensemble two at John Adams. And you note the year, these are all tied to the plan. And there's all, even a mariachi three, there's, there's curriculum for each of these and their, their advanced curriculum as we move up. And also the, uh, the wardrobe is different. The, the tie is going to be worn for the most beginning students with a white shirt. And um, uh, when I talked to Marsha Neal about her program up in Clark County in Vegas, those students are the more advanced, so they're probably the most advanced students where they wear the full the full regalia there. They have the hats, the, the coats, and everything. And that's the, that's the big deal. When they get into that ensemble, it's a, it's a real matter of pride for our students. And then Sam High it would be just continuing that same thing. But now, the difference is we've built a root system. We've, we have, we've built it from fifth grade, and it's growing into middle school. Skills are being built. And of course, in our district, the music program is so extraordinary. The kids are coming in with so much ability already. It's going, the, the main piece I want to stress about mariachi that I was very, cons I wanted to make sure is a piece of this. Standards based, it has to be literacy, it has to be reading, it can't be by rote. So all the curriculum we've, we've talked with Marsha Neal, this will all be taught with uh, textbooks that are from the, uh, from the culture, but they're also going to be, um, you know, kids will be reading notes. They're not going to be like, you know, here's like, you know, you've all heard of the guitar players with the tabs, right? So we want to talk about a G minor seven versus put your fingers here, right? So that's it. I think that was it. We, we purchased a text textbook uh, as well that was recommended as part of the training, and all that has been purchased. And I wanted to personally, I wanted to mention uh, the funding. Um, we were able to do this with $22,000 um, grant from the city. Now my notes have arrived. I don't know why they didn't before. But um, I wanted to thank uh, City Council Member Tony Vasquez for support of this program all along the way. And uh, that's been an integral part of how we're able to do this work. So thank you to him very much. And Maria, thank you for always being, Maria is the passionate art supporter, and you all are, by the way. Thank you so much for all your support of the arts. But Maria and I have been known each other for 18 years, and, and it's always been something we're talking about. So it's finally here. We're all excited. All right, so if I can answer any questions, comments? Right. Yes. And then Maria. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Yo, what would you say is our, because I've attempted this in my high school just like you. Uh, when I was a principal, it was difficult because of the, the, the level of skill with the music. I mean, how, what, what do you see will be the biggest challenge there? Oh. Know, with the guitar, is it going to be the guitar, the flutes, or? Yeah. What is the biggest challenge yeah. of? Uh, of, of uh, having, the, having the students being able to master this, I guess. Um, I think um, 
I, I actually don't, I'm not anticipating, maybe I'm just a positive thinker, I'm just, but uh, <laughs> uh, we also, another thing I meant to mention earlier is as part of this process, we're gonna be identifying, I, I have what someone I think I have identified already will be the mariachi, I call them the mariachi guru. It's part of our budget and the three year plan. Somebody will be coming in to work with our teachers. So we'll have a mixture of our certificated staff doing the instruction, but also someone immersed in the culture, the music, it doesn't have to be a certificated person because we need their expertise in the culture and the music and that our teachers mm -hmm. can teach the literacy and the, you know, the, what has to be taught, but they, they might need a little help with, hey, you know, when I teach jazz, even some of our teachers don't know what I'm saying about jazz. It's a, it's a whole other way of teaching, another articulation and phrasing. So to answer your question, I think that's probably the most challenging is getting, you know, we're assuming that many of our Latino students are gonna be in this program, but I imagine there's gonna be students from all, all cultures and races in our district being involved with the program. And some of those kids, and that's great, they're gonna be immersed in a new culture and understand another culture and might have more understanding for those around them. So I hope that answers your question. Do you wanna go back to Oh. Dr. Marlon, and then we have Lori Maria and that'll be it, our list. Thank you. Um, what, I, what I'd like to highlight is I think, um, as Tom mentioned, we are really starting with our youngest learners. So I think that's really what's going to support the development of the program. I think that's something that was learning on our end as, as a district, right? We're a learning organization, so at time, we try something and if, if we fail forward, what can we learn from that first attempt? And we learned that we need to begin with our youngest learner. So we really appreciate, you know, Lori Oram's openness and willingness to host this and then our board's support in this process because I think it's really a wonderful experience for all of our students to have and to really see and develop those skill sets at the elementary and build it all the way through high school year after year. Thank you, Dr. Mora. Lori. So actually I was gonna ask the question in this way, which is similar to what I think Dr. Drotty was asking about. I, we've been to CSBA conferences multiple times where there have been districts um, where they had these incredible presentations of students who, did, who performed mariachi music. And so I'm wondering whether we've reached out to some, because there are, there are multiple districts who have very successful programs I and mean, have probably had them in place for many years. And it seems like we could, to the concerns like that Dr. Drotty raised and the things we can anticipate and some of it we can't, but we might reach out to one or two of those and see what they have to offer. We by have, way of experience. I have, I have. Yeah, we first started with the group in Las Vegas, which is Maria Neal is the coordinator like I am up in Los Clark County. And that cost was $4,000 to bring the award-winning uh, middle school group down. And that's the group I ideally wanted, our middle school mm -hmm. kids. But I'm, um, right now I've, I've heard back from UCLA and they're very interested in bringing a, a, a younger group there. But um, also um, uh, Plaza de la Raza has, has some very, fine groups as well, and I've made a few other phone calls I haven't heard back yet, but ideally I'm looking for younger groups. Mm -hmm. I've also been out to observe other teachers and programs. I'm being very picky. If I, I watched an hour of teaching, and I, you know, I'm just saying, what I saw wasn't quite what I want. I mean, I saw the kids were participating, but I was hearing issues that weren't being addressed that I thought should have been addressed. I'm just being really picky. I have some time and I want to make sure we find that person who's got it all going on, right? The right person. But that's great. And if you have some, Lori, if you have some names of some groups that you remember, then I'd love to hear about that. I'd have to look at old agendas and see what the, <laughs> <laughs> what the districts were, but maybe somebody else up here will remember that too because they're really impressive. And I think all of us probably have responded the same way and said, hey, we that is something that yeah. we, would be a go at our district, I think, and really be something that we'd. No, I'm, I'm just, I was partly thinking though of the, some of the, trying to anticipate some of the obstacles and see what they, maybe we could sort of shortcut some of the problems if we learn from some other districts. 
Another thing that came up too is that um, a possible issue and a, a positive and a negative at Samuel High is the positive is we could possibly do a dual enrollment situation with SMC. That's a positive where kids could be getting um, college credit that they can use that towards advancing themselves into college. It raises their GPA because it's considered almost like a uh, AP class, right? Like jazz band is for Sam High. Mm -hmm. The issue though is that it's a good problem. We have so much going on with seven orchestras, mm -hmm. five concert bands, five choirs, two jazz bands. There's so much going on every day after school. All the rooms are essentially mm -hmm. being used. So I'm, I anticipate that being an issue. So I think we're gonna need to build a new building. Uh, just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> We can call it the Whaley Wing. Whaley Wing, okay. Is that too much? Okay. <laughs> well, the John Adams Auditorium might have some room in there. For <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Laurie. Maria. Thank you both. I think it's one of those that's been on my plate for a long, long time. I know when we set off in 2008, it was an experiment because I kept pushing, but there again, we started up like at the high end yeah. of the mark in terms of orchestras. So we knew that we had to build it from, from, from scratch, from, from the young, younger, and build it up to middle and high school. One of the key things I wanna do, I would um, like to appreciate uh, Dr. Drotty, is Dr. Dr. Mora, because she really stepped in. When, even when we were interviewing you, I figured she would be coming in with us. And it, it was a great choice to bring, because he's for the first time, somebody who's listening to really, when we're talking about um, um, social justice, and in, and in being inclusive of everybody. I mean, it's the first time in all my years I've been on the board that somebody has been that open, in, on, you know, from the superintendent on down to really understand what it means. We've talked the talk so many years, but we've never walked that talk. And so even last night when I was at the BAPA DAC, it's unbelievable, the, the comments that they made to me. And here, these are all people that I've, support, that I've always supported me because I've always supported music when it was on the yeah. chopping block. I was the one that, that that stuck out my neck to make sure that we didn't destroy the, the, the music program. But for them to ask questions in terms of that this kind of programming of music would diminish, diminish the expectations of our future children in, in moving up into the, into the orchestras in the high schools. I'm going like, excuse me? You know, this isn't what we're meant, what is this meant to be? I mean, we're building it. And, and right now it's gonna be after school eventually Hopefully it'll be part of the curriculum piece. It'll be part of their school day mm -hmm. as they start in middle school and we'll make it work. Yep. You know, we're, we're a stellar program, but the stellar programs can exist like they existed 20 years ago. This is 2018. And with that comes the fact that there's more in terms of diversity in, in California, obviously in California and in, in Los Angeles. Yeah. And we're part of that make big micro, microcosm of people. So I, I'm hoping that people will take it as a positive, if nothing more than an enhancement of our future music, and hopefully we'll have dance. Richard, you were gonna explain. I know Dr. Ju I, I took my first ballet for Corico with Dr. Judith Douglas, so she was my ballet for Corico teacher from CSMC. Even though she doesn't want to admit it, because she, she goes, well, you must have been older than me, and I go, yeah, yeah, whatever, I was. <laughs> but anyway, um, it's one of those pieces that we hope that, that will grow, but I thank you all, because, and Dr. Moore, especially because you listen, because like five or six years ago, I did bring back, and I was talking to Maria Neal from, from Las Vegas some years back, but you know, it's, if you don't understand this process, then it's hard for you to really develop that program un until you know somebody that really understands what it really means. So I hope it's the very beginning. And um, the investment in the future, we've, you know, for us, since Tony was the mayor of the city, has had a lot of conversations with business folks here in, in the city of Santa Monica. So they're willing to invest. They're willing to invest in this program, especially a lot of the Mexican restaurants and Latino restaurants, because they want to see the children. They wouldn't, they wouldn't mind investing because they're homegrown mm -hmm. uh, mariachi to come and play, and this is where how they can we can really support this program in the future because they can go to perform just like the orchestra performs at weddings and so forth and at their events, at, at receptions that we can actually have them come in. And like and, the jazz band. Too. Yeah, and the jazz band too. We've gone to yeah, a lot of the programs there, so I'm hoping that this is just a big piece. And this is the last piece of it, that if we get an opportunity to take a group of people to Tucson, um, Arizona in April, they have the big mariachi festival there. I know that in Las Vegas they usually do, but I think that's in, later on in June. 
but this one is in March, so maybe we can take some students and some of us could go. Yeah, because me, you'll me, see, and you. me and you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You'll see that. I haven't, been, I haven't been there, so I haven't even gone. It's one of those things that I need to go, but I will definitely try to make it for next year because I would like to see, you could see kids from all throughout the range, and not just Latino children. You're talking about Asian children, you know, you know, people from all over the world playing at these, at these, in this, so it's just so great to see that people follow, follow this kind of music. I, so. I'd also like to echo your praise of Dr. Morris. She's been great to work with, uh, with me on this, and she's been su supportive in the past. I didn't always get that support, but I'm getting that support. And, and thank you, you know, because you developed it, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, because uh -huh. of your support, too, the financial piece was always a big what do I do? How do I do that? And, and I just thought if I could just get something started, the money will come. But at this yeah, yeah. twenty-two thousand is a good place to start. So thank you very much. No, thank you. All. Thank this you, is Maria. Be fun. This is John, and then fun. Oscar. Okay. So I think this is a great beginning for a program. I think eventually we're going to see this have to trickle down to the feeder schools to jams. Um, so we'll start seeing Rogers and Grant. Uh, and Muir and perhaps Smash picking up this program and growing and then it will come to the Lincoln feeder schools as well. Which brings me to what might to go jump back to Lori's group and their presentation. Um, I love the fact that these kids at Edison are getting a lesson in California history that's not, I think you said non-traditional California history or whatever it was and I'm like, that's wonderful yeah. for the kids at Edison. The mariachi wonderful for the kids at Edison. It's, a, it's the right place to start, but we've got to have this cultural stuff start sprinkling throughout our entire district so that people aren't looking at mariachi as something you see when you go to, you know, uh, you know, wherever you're going to go, and it becomes something that's culturally relevant. So, I mean, this is broken, this is broken, broken what? Broken drum? Broken something? Broken something for me. I, I really want to see us embrace our local culture in an honest, real, and engaging way, and I love that you're doing that. I just want to see it throughout our schools. I know Edison has an easier on-ramp to that, maybe, in some ways, and I loved how you talk about not heroes and holidays, but this is my, my soapbox. Anyway, thank you for beginning of something. Is that it's a broken record? Broken record. There you go. And it's a pilot, John. It's a, it's a pilot that we're hoping will grow. Yeah. Yeah. So thank okay. You. Thank you. Oscar, and then I have myself on the list. Yeah. No. So I'm really glad that we're uh, we made ser some serious inroads because when we started talking about this back in 2008, um, and I remember talking to Dr. Pedrosa, and you know we try to get young people engaged, and it was very difficult because we didn't really have something to really offer them. Um, so it just goes to show, you know, that if we put some research, some planning, you know, we prioritize this, and also some targeted funding. Mm -hmm. um, that makes a big difference. Then staff has something to work with and something to offer the young people, and then the young people will start engaging. So I, so I think it's important for us to reflect on that. Uh, I'm excited about it because um, I know my, my children, you know, my son is very into music, and he's excited. When I talked to him about mariachi, and he was like, oh, that'd be great, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's other things that come out of this. For example, um, you know, when young people get pretty good, whenever there's a quinceanera or there's a wedding or there's something going on or even an event that we have here in the school district, our own fundraising or whatever, any cool event that we have, to have the mariachi band play, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, mm -hmm. and the, the, the young people can, um, they, can make a, they can raise a little bit of revenue you know, for, for the program as well, you know, playing at different, because it's about like $500 an hour right now to contract the mariachi band in Los Angeles. Um, one thing that I read in the article that was really powerful is the idea of bringing in people that are already practicing, so the practitioners, because sometimes, you know, we say oh, we want uh, a music teacher, you know, and with all the credentials, and sometimes just the guy at Plaza de Mariachi that has been playing for the past 20 years is the type of person you want to bring in, you know, to teach. I couldn't agree more. You know, so that, that yeah. I think, uh, was really powerful in the article that you shared with us, yeah. so um, I'd love to see that. Um, I think it's going to be exciting for our, for our school community, and I agree with John that we need to, as, as soon as we can, start um, expanding. But I think you sh you're showing here that there's a, you know, a, a, a pilot, and then we're going to expand as we go. Um, so I think this is great. One of the last, thi bef one of the last things I want to say is uh, I want to start the process of us reflecting on how we can engage the young people around hip hop culture, um, because I think that's another big, big impact for young people talking about student centered. Uh, I think if we and I know we do dance, so that's, that's something that we do already. And some, some teachers integrate uh, graffiti art within their, their art classes. 
But um, I can just speak from experience that um, the music side, the recording uh, arts, you know, you, you bringing in technology and teaching the recording and the software um, is just, it's, it's a great way to engage young people. So um, I look forward to, to seeing an expansion in that area. I know Olympic is, 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 is working on something, but unless you have something else to say about I, Olympic. I wanted to just say, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, we have a six year strategic plan in visual and performing arts that will be coming before you in the next few months. Uh, we actually have it finished, but we wanted more teacher input. We didn't get, we, I didn't feel we had quite enough teacher input, uh, but we had a great team, the community arts team, we call it CAT team. And so in that Oscar, there's a lot of talk about, you know, we call it 21st century, but what are we calling it now? That's exactly right, yes. Um, future ready. Uh, but that's what that's what we talk about in there. We need to be ready for that. The, when a student comes to us that does, doesn't play the violin or sings in a choir, but say, I can say to the kid, "Hey, I want you to do eight bars of rap. What's what's eight bars? What's a measure? Well, a measure is this, and then in four four time. Well, what is what does that mean? And then so you're teaching the the standards, but you're doing it through the act. You're accessing that student with their prior knowledge, what they're excited about, and that ties them to school. Many of our kids that were most passionate about having success in school would, would flourish with a program like that. So I'm hoping that we can do just what Oscar said in the next few years. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, um, Tom. It's, um, myself, and I think then Ralph. So, okay. Just I'm gonna see if anybody else wants to jump in. Um, I just wanted to again congratulate the, the uh, to join in in the congratulation of the staff and of the, the uh, VAPADAC and to the members of the board who've been working for so long on expanding the arts in this area. What a great day it is, right, to be able to have a report on the expanding of arts in the district. Um, what I wanted to share with you, um, or I just wanted to echo something that uh, John said and then it uh, dovetails into what Oscar um, said. And I know we're not supposed to repeat ourselves, but I hope that there's a little unique something here um, as, a con as a piece. What? Oh, thank you, thank you, I'll be quick. Um, I want, well, one thing I wanted to share is that uh, the Public Policy Institute of the college, which I'm the co-director, we have an arts and uh, cultural affairs program, and we're bringing in an all-female mariachi, mariachi corazon de Mexico, Mexico, um, and that'll be on the 13th, and so I'll make sure that the staff, if, if any music teachers or folks want to see that, and I wanted to say, Oscar, we paid $2,000 for this all-female mariachi to come in for an activity hour, um, and it's going to be really spectacular because we're doing a whole thing on gentrification and focusing on Vida and the arts. Um, but that being said, uh, I think it's a great idea to think forward to be dreaming about the opportunities for kids to be our student musicians, to be performing as the jazz band. We've used them many times at the, your, the jazz band, San Juan High Jazz Band. Um, I was gonna say, please keep dreaming. Um, we have an incredible music program, we know that, and when we go and watch these music programs at San Juan High and, and at Malibu High, we recognize clearly that we have an arts high schools, right? We do that. When people say, oh, we need a, an arts high school in the district, I'm like, dude, we have them. We have, we have multiple sites. We have, we have uh, a strong focus on the arts. But when Maria said that Judith Douglas uh, had taught her her first um, ballet de folklorico, I was thinking about what we've been dreaming about with the arts and the expansion of dance and the work that we're doing with um, Nathan Birnbaum and the city's commission on the arts. And everyone says that we are lacking in dance. Absolutely. And, and it's such an easy merge, right, of the commitment yep. of, to the musical arts and thinking about um, dance. And particularly the way in which uh, we were saying this evening when we were in closed session eating dinner, that's what I'm mentioning the closed session, that, that we're such a fusion place and that we are so um, accustomed to seeing different cultures interact and, and fuse together in ways and so I wanted to echo that we want to see children who are um, not of Latino culture exclusively participating in the mariachi would be great right it's very good and then uh, lastly and thank you for forgiving me Lori uh, the um, I went to New York City and I went, I thought I knew something about hip hop Oscar. I thought I did, you know, I'm teaching you know, difference <laughs> politics at the college. But I went to an incredible exhibit on hip hop uh, and the origination of hip hop and what it means, particular in a political setting and all the stuff that we know. But it was such an incredible eye opener for me in the way in which hip hop can be used as a 
tool for teaching so many of um, those kind of contemporaries, uh, not contemporary, but the subjects we expect students to be, uh, to, to, to have mastery in. So I just wanted to echo what Oscar said mm -hmm. also, and then ask you, are we planning and are we launching the sixth grade hip hop dance throughout the district? Do we, we are, that's happening. Okay, so we'll hear maybe about that. Yeah. Um, so that's an exciting thing too. And I, I just, I'm blabbering, but I just want to say thank you. And I say we keep dreaming together because this, uh, it shouldn't have taken this long, 18 years, Maria, that's what you said. Yeah, well, that's the good piece is because of my connections with, you know, because I'm at SMC doing a lot of these dual enrollment courses and concurrent enrollment that, um, and with, again, one of uh, the foresight of, of this district now with, you know, Dr. Mora and Dr. Drotti is that they have Dr. Um, Devin Smith, Devon Smith, coming in in working those and so now with him there, I think we're going to have a really nice expansion that you're talking about the arts and a lot of other things in the district. So I think it'll be great. And first and foremost, and it's nothing that we're going to be take bringing in faculty from SMC here, but we're hoping to have our own faculty step up to the plate and become SMC adjuncts for us. And so we'll be using our own faculty here at the, at the, at the school district to hopefully fill up some of those spots that I hope we have more classes. I have to say how proud I am to be in a district where the board is telling me about your dreams of arts education. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like surreal. I mean, I, I talk to my uh, contemporaries and then <laughs> that's not the case. So thank you all for your commitment to the arts. Richard, for the Nutcracker performance coming up and another one in the spring that you've been supporting. The new fourth grade dance program we're going to be offering in, is the uh, World Dance Program. It's, it's uh, mec they call it Latin Mexican dance is what they call it, African dance and Hawaiian dance. The principals can choose one of those dances. So that's exposing kids to culture and dance. And I would love, by the way, I wanted to tell you dance is prominent in the six year plan. So you'll see that and what we want to do for all the arts. But uh, the, the big issue is time, space and money. You know, where, how can you pay for it? Where's it going to be taught? When's it going to be taught? And to me, the answer to dance is through PE somehow, because it's already in the curriculum, but that's how at an elementary school level, we can get dance into the day without losing instructional time. It's already written in the curriculum. We just got to figure out how, whether it's training PE teachers to implement or bringing in specialists that rotate, I, I don't know. But that's part of what we'll discuss in the plan. Great, thank you, Tom. We have two more speakers, two more comments yes. for you, um, Mr. Metcher, and then Ms. Afshar, and that'll be our last, and we'll conclude. Thank uh, you. I'm just gonna say that, you know, thank for everybody working so hard to, to bring this. You can see the enthusiasm we have for arts in, in our district. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. Thank you, Ralph. Ms. Afshar. Um, I was just gonna say, I, um, I love the cultural recognition via the arts education, and I understand that it's like a test run at SAMO, but I feel like we don't, we don't nearly enough recognize our minorities within Malibu High School, and I feel like that's something that we could really benefit from. I don't see as many programs in Malibu High, and I understand it's a smaller school, but I feel like it would be fantastic if in the future we can implement programs such as these. This is a pilot, yeah. so that means it's intended to grow to be at both high schools. I mean, the pathway would go in that direction once it gets going, but that's, I hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Afshar. Mr. Whaley, Dr. Mora, Dr. Drotty, thank you. On thank behalf you. of all of us on the board, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Drotty, that brings us now to our discussion item, uh, the Santa Monica Education Foundation, our quarterly fundraising update. And I see our friends in the audience We're wearing I'd like to invite Rep. Mrs. Uh, Lena Greenberg. Uh, Dr. Jessman, I will step down for this item. Thank you. We'll come right back and get you. We'll run right out. I just want to say how we're excited about the Mariachi program, too, and we're always so proud to be of service when the district calls and needs us, and thank you, Dr. Mora, for reaching out. When you needed a conduit through which those funds could flow, we were happy to be there. So thank you. Um, so we thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, we. I want to start out, you all know Rachel Faulkner, she's our Associate Director at the Ed Foundation. And I just want to start out with a story because I think we at the Ed Foundation get to hear these stories all the time. Uh, it shows the impact of the funds that we um, are allocating and they're just, they're just great. So we're going to start and end with the story tonight. 
So Marcella is 13 and in eighth grade. She's a native Spanish speaker who has worked hard to learn English, and she still works hard in all her subjects, especially language arts, which she finds challenging, but she loves to learn. Her eyes are curious, her smile is confident. So when Marcella, who was getting A's and B's, got her first C in language arts, she turned to a new tool for help, mindfulness. Yes, mindfulness. Two of the programs we provide funding for are the mindfulness programs in our Santa Monica middle schools. Middle schoolers are learning how to meditate. That, this work is powerful. Do you remember being 13? I certainly do. It's like our brains regress to fight or flight mode in response to everything, which is exactly why our middle school principals thought it was critical to try something different, to give our students a new tool that would better prepare them in their studies and in life, learning how to focus their awareness on the present moment, which is exactly what Marcella did, who told her principal with surprised excitement, it really worked. Marcella is now in high school using mindfulness more and more at home and in school. She finds it especially helpful in calming herself down before a big test. And this is literally what we hear over and over again from not only the teachers, but students who are um, incorporating mindfulness into their daily routines at middle school. So now that Linda's inspired you with a story, I will inspire you with some numbers, hopefully. Um, we just wanted to start off by letting you know that we have raised one point, uh, just $1,325,536 toward our annual grant to the district for 1920 programs. So when we look at um, the, the money raised and we look at parent donations, so as of September 30th, we've raised just over $1.1 million from parents. Um, comprised of 1,589 donors, and in all of last year, we raised uh, just uh, oh, you know a, a little bit over 1.5 million dollars from 2,560 parents in Santa Monica. So we hopefully are on track to beat, surpass that number. Um, as you know, our parent campaign ends on January 31st of 2019, but we will still be collecting donations after that through June 30th. What's exciting to see is that our average gift per household still continues to increase. So you see, starting in 2014, how it's jumped up. Um, it's $250 higher per household now, um, which is a good trend, obviously, to see. When we look at <clears throat> participation, as of uh, October 15th, we're at 26.5% of Santa Monica families having uh, donated. In all of last year, Santa, uh, uh, just under 42% of Santa Monica families donated. And then you can see the staff um, numbers. We have 28% of staff currently donating and the breakdown between managers, management teachers and classified as compared to last year. So Rachel, so you've already taken out Malibu numbers from the data you're giving us now. From so the families. So your 17, 18 data excludes all the Malibu staff, teachers, parents? Actually, um, the ma we, we did not fix the management numbers, okay. uh, the, the staff numbers. The families num the family so, numbers are Santa Monica great. families only. Okay, so we're doing great apples to, that to apples. Forward, that's, yes. that's an important change this year. Absolutely, because you. So you can see. My apologies. So when we look at our major uh, donor giving circles, we have the superintendent circle of donors of $5,000 or more. As of 9.30, we're over just over $330,000 raised from 58 donors and ended at, at 592,000 um, with 85 donors. And we have a lot of, we've continuing our work in that um, a lot, especially now that the first quarter's over, we do a lot more individual outreach to the, these groups. Um, and then the leadership circle, which is $2,500 to $4,999, we have raised just under $150,000 from 56 donors. Then we look at corporate partners. As of September 30th, um, we've raised $149,280 from uh, 14 corporate partners. You'll see that we ended last year raising just under $350,000 You'll see the majority of our corporate partner income coming in in the spring when our events happen. They come in as mostly as sponsors. So we uh, had our pledge days, our fourth 
annual pledge days and we bookended it. We, we had a big back to school match, as you know, $50,000 match. And we wanted to bookend the first two months of really heavy fundraising with a uh, pledge days match at the end of September. So for in seven days, we were very excited to raise $255,000 from 351 donors. That includes the $50,000 from One West Bank and Santa Monica Place in Mesa Ridge. We also, during that seven days, had two flash matches from local businesses, Flex Tutoring, which is in West LA, and David Yoon, um, who is a realtor with Compass and the 88 Group, who is also a current Lincoln parent. So Rachel mentioned that our annual campaign goes through January 31st. Uh, and again, we'll still take money all the way through June 30th. But we're going to focus on our renewals. You know, people just need a little reminding. Uh, we're going to we're doing a, a specific outreach to TK and K families because we really believe that if we can get them in the habit of giving when they first start, they will continue that pattern of giving throughout their time with us at SMMUSD. Uh, we're going to, as Rachel mentioned, our continue outreach to our corporate heroes uh, in the spring. We are always looking for foundation grants that will fund the initiatives that the district has chosen. Um, we, Rachel works very carefully with each school to come up with school-specific plans. W some things that work at one school may not work at another, so she's very active on that. We have Giving Tuesday, which is a National Day of Giving coming up in November, November 20, what? 7th. 7th. Um, and then we do a very strong calendar year-end year -end campaign and again another one for the last uh, month of January. We have a couple new initiatives that we're going to launch this year. One is a grandparents club. Uh, one is really to focus on planned giving. And we want to start something new with our retirees. You know, they put in their time here. This is their family. They retire, and uh, except for maybe some communications from HR, um, they, we, they never really get to see us again. So we're going to start having an annual get-together for retirees, and I think that will lead to more annual giving and planned giving. So we're really excited about that. Um, and that is it, except that I said I was going to end with a story. So I'm going to read another one that I, I loved hearing about. Johnny is a junior at Samo High. Johnny lives with his mother, older sister, and younger brother in a cozy two-bedroom apartment in Santa Monica. Johnny's mother and sister leave for work before dawn each day. So Johnny prepares breakfast for his younger brother and gets them ready and out the door by 7 AM to walk his little brother to school at McKinley before he catches the big blue bus to Samo High. Johnny is a hardworking student, an avid soccer player. He also plays bassoon in the Wind Symphony, the second highest of seven bands at Samo High. For the first time in his life, Johnny got to travel abroad this past summer with Samo High bandmates and the director as part of the Southern California Music Ambassadors. Johnny says he feels really lucky and appreciative to be part of an amazing music program. He says, and I quote, I get to have my own instrument where even the reeds are provided and they're $20 a piece. And I also get private music lessons, he explained proudly. Johnny's luck is provided by donors who believe in the power of a robust, robust and well-rounded education. So just another great example of our donors' impact. And that is it, except to tell Oscar, um, we actually last year started funding hip hop in the sixth grade through our PE classes, through our um, so that started last year and is continuing this year. Not for as long as we'd like, you know, meaning I think it's like eight or ten weeks of it, but they're getting some exposure through the PE program with our dance uh, specialist. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lori, and then Maria. I have a couple completely different questions from each other. Sure. One is, in all of the presentation of the numbers here, is what you're saying that as of today, you're not comparing to 10, 15, 17 and where we were from the, to the prior year, you're comparing to the in total year. Correct. So do you have any idea? Are we like in about the sure. same? We, we do. We are, um, as of, so, so we do a couple of reports on a monthly basis at month end and so our most recent report as of 9.30 shows that we're 8% ahead of where we were this time last year um, in terms of fundraise, funds raised toward the annual fund. And we are 7% ahead 
um, in terms of uh, participation when we look at Santa Monica families last year versus Santa Monica th families this year participating. Okay, and actually I lied because I have one other, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> another question on what you've presented, which is on the corporate partners, when you say we had 47 last, last year and we're year. at 14, do yeah. we expect most of them are, do they, some of them even have continuing commitments over multiple years? Um, a few of them have made multi-year commitments. Um, others who can't do that because their, their companies don't want to do that mm -hmm. have indicated that they intend to continue and, and we have seen very little drop off. Maybe a couple of our lower end um, corporate partners have dropped off, um, but honestly the biggest donors have continued to support us. And as Rachel said, even though it looks like we're only at 14 now, we ended the year with 47, most of them do come in. We start soliciting them in December and January. You know, they came in at the second part of last fiscal year. So even though the January 31 date is the formal end, a lot of this is not really done by then? No, as I said, we will keep, okay. uh, the January 31st is the end of the parent campaign. Okay. So we will continue with our corporate partners all the way through June. Okay, so my other question has to do with your idea about the retirees, mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting and nice. But what I wonder is, why don't we start creating some kind of alumni thing? And I know that we have obstacles with getting to the Alumni Association, which I th suggest that we collectively, not just you, um, try to break through, right. um, but also, even if we're unable to do that, start with the next class of graduates and build an alumni kind of so we have, uh, approach. That's right, so we, a couple things on alumni, and I would appreciate any help that any of the board or the superintendent want to give us with uh, the Alumni Association. However, we have started, we do, um, starting last year, the year before, we start, two years ago, we started <laughs> sending uh, a letter home and an email to all Samo High and Malibu High graduates. Um, just kind of congratulating them, letting them know who we are, what we do, and you know, asking for their support. Uh, th to think of us as they continue along their careers. And we, we plan to keep that up. Um, so that is something that we did start recently. We do have a list of um, some very um, high level prospects who are alumni that we, are, we don't have connections to, except we know they went to Samo High. We're trying to see if there are still people at Samo High who work at Samo High who have those connections. But in the meantime, you know, if we don't have them, we're still soliciting them on an individual basis. Because those would be a very targeted ask. Those would not be yeah. just a letter, please you know, s support what you can. Those will be very targeted ask around initiatives that they have interest in. Right, I know I think that's terrific and maybe even if we got one of those, we may maybe be able to use that that's to right. get into the, I, I mean I will say that I understand how in one sense if you're an alumni association, you wanna hold those people together and you don't want them only to feel like all they are is a um, place where people hit you up for money for everything possible. But we don't, there aren't that many things that in our district we actually hit people who are not parents in the district currently up for money about. And it doesn't seem, it seems right to me that we find a way to get into the alumni and that some of them, it seems to me, would be responsive if, if there were a way in. So, so we'll be able to share with you how successful we oh. are. I know you we, haven't we been, and I, I, that's partly, I guess, why I'm raising it, because I'm not, I don't in any way blame you, and, and I know how hard you've worked at it. I just, I guess I wanted to say it out loud, because I think it's something we all should think about ways to penetrate, if you will. Thank you, Lori. Maria, and then I have myself on the list. No, no, the other thing, thank you, thank you so much. I know of the alum, I mean, it's, it all depends on finally getting somebody there that's going to really take uh, that opportunity to, to do that. And we feel, of all the presidents we've had, that we haven't had anybody yet to, to really take it on. And because the alum have never been asked, to be honest with you. I don't think, 
maybe 10% of them maybe, but I don't think they really, they've never been asked for money. So to say that we are always approaching them for money, we, I don't think so, unless they're, they're connected somewhere with sports or, or with, uh, with the music, because there, there's some of them, I still go to the concert, and I still see the parents that were with my daughter, and, and I see them, and, and I know they get involved still. But um, I mean, it's, it's so wonderful, because my experience has been, and I'll let you know, because I hand counted the, the number of Latinos in that top orchestra, I hand counted. And so when my daughter went through it, I mean, there was, you know, at one point there was three, three women, and I think two, two males. At the end of the day, um, there was only like, her and, and the other one's Patti Del Valle's daughter. And, we're, and because, you know, you know Patti Del Valle from SMC. And so it was only my daughter and her um, that were part of the orchestra. So part of the thing is that they have so many memories. I mean, the fact that they were the first orchestra to play at Disney Concert Hall, the first high school orchestra to, or, to actually initiate this Disney Concert Hall. For all those times they played at the, at the, the fundraiser with all the the musicians, you know, the, the, the rock concerts, they just had a great time. I mean, it's unbelievable. And they still, I mean, when we get together, when they still come over to the house, they show me the pictures that they took with them. And it goes, oh, we had so much fun. And I'm always asking, you know, me, it's like, oh, did you have a great time? Oh, sure, so I'm always asking. But one of the key ones, though, that, that one of this, with my son, it was even, because my son never went through the whole process. He did his one year, because that's all he wanted to do for the A through G, at that time it was A through F, that's all he wanted to do. But there was only one Latino that I can count that went actually to the top orchestra straight to the four years. And for him, he still remembers as his ultimate, I mean, he's now 33 years old, but he remembers that because it was the only time that the orchestra played at Carnegie Hall in New York. And it was his, like, he still remembers, it's like, who plays Carnegie? But that orchestra that year, in his senior year, played Carnegie, and he still remembers as one of his main things of, of his lifetime that he got to play. And he'll tell people I played at Carnegie. And I think they're trying to get there again this coming year. But you know, that's those are the top memories that that, you know. You know, I remember Dr. 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 when you first coming in and you saw the coral, I'm sorry, the coral coming in, and he goes, This is the coral program? And I go, Yes, it is. And now they're coming. He remembers. But <laughs> so anyway, we, we've got a long way to go. But you know, thank you so much because this really does. I just hope that, and, and I'm, making, I'm always making my pitches with a lot of the Latino families because I think a lot of them always think, oh, well, I don't have it. Because even if you give $5, because it doesn't matter the amount, it's just we need the percentage of families to go up because that's what other big funders look at. If, if you go from 41 to like 70%, they're going to say, wow, and they'll give us more money. So that's really what we want to get to that point where you know, whatever you, people give, I mean, We'll take the, you know, we'll take, bring back some of the students that, that, you know, bring them back to, to perform for us. That's what, oh, that's the other thing I was going to tell you. A lot of the alum want to come back to perform at, at the concert. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. No, thank you both. Thank you so much. Thank you for the. Audience. Thank you for your good works. I was just going to mention that, that when I hear Lori um, speak of the alumni and maybe how it's been a tough nut to crack. I'm thinking about how we could begin, you could, with the Ed Foundation and we together, start a new, I mean, not a new, but start at this moment. If you're having a difficult time cracking an existing institution, or a comp I mean, there's, no, there's nothing stopping us from creating another alumni association. <laughs> I, I'm absolutely serious. Mm -hmm. And it's, we start now with the kids who are graduating this year and moving forward. I mean, if, if we're looking at um, being able to stay in contact with the young people who are now adults and are making their way through the world and we can't get access to them, there's no reason why we can't start our own alumni association now. That's my position. Craig. Yeah. Uh, I'm obviously um, unfamiliar with the history but I've been thinking about this as well for other reasons. And it seems to me that alumni associations, the, the question would be where, if you didn't have one, hypothetically speaking, like in Malibu, where would it live? And alumni association, in my experience, whether high school or college, are always part of the development effort and they're housed in the development part of the entity. And in fact, sometimes they call it the alumni, but it's a development act. It's purely a development. 
and the rest of it is to serve the development. So I don't know what the specifics are, but it seems to me, we, first of all, we want an active alumni association because it's a good thing to have. Second thing, we got to place, find a place to put it where it's viable, and I don't think we can spend state resources to house it within the district. And third off, the very logical place is within the, the development group, which is you guys. So whether, and we have tools available to us, there's probably questions about use of name and certainly use of, of contact information and all that sort of thing. So I think we can have a, 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 a robust conversation on this subject where we can find collaboration or worst case scenario, we begin to develop and we should be catching the seniors on the way out the door and tracking. And I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's professional services that everybody's got to figure this out. Like, where did our kids go? And I'm sure there are people who specialize in rounding that up and giving data. Yep. So, I mean, I think that's uh, a great idea. And our alumni, I'm sure, are very capable of supporting these institutions. And I know in other schools you have wings named after alumni and there are alumni let's just say there are alumni who could be very supportive of our ongoing efforts so i mean i think that's great and i, I what i heard is thorough support from this board to pursue that if you wish to Lori? yeah and I, I think we should take this conversation and have it in a small group just so that we don't have to do it all here but i, I, I was going to say that um Dr. Drotty and I were at this Alumni Association event recently where they did their induction into the Hall of Fame right. of Ben Allen and right. some other very interesting, distinguished alumni who neither one of us knew or knew of. It was fascinating and it was, and, and actually it was kind of, it, it was, it made you feel great to be part of this sure. institution that's been alive for a long time that not, nobody here um, even people like my husband, who grew up with some of these people, probably <laughs> knows the sort of the um, breadth yeah. of where some of these people have gone to and the things. It was really, really interesting, exciting, made me feel great. I, as I know Dr. Drotty did, was like, wow. Um, and, and that's not to say that other districts probably don't have that same thing. If you went to that, it, but it's figuring out how to uh, bring them together into this, and as Craig just put it, it is true that in other places, they're automatically sort of linked. But um, so we need to find a way and talk about that because I, I think we'll come up with some ideas. The chair hears your recommendation for a smaller group to be formed to work directly, and we do have a liaison to the Santa Monica Ed Foundation. That's me. <laughs> So. We look forward to talking with you about that. We couldn't agree more. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you, thank you. Welcome back, Mr. Metzger. Friends, we now move to our major action items for the evening. Um, we are, um, we've pulled item 9A, and so we're moving to item 9B, which is our public hearing negotiation proposals for the SMM uh, USD, that's us, and the SMM CTA, the Santa Monica Malibu Classroom Teachers Association. This is a public hearing. It requires us to open the hearing by a vote of the board. Is there a motion to open this hearing? Moved, Moved by John and seconded by Lori. This is a roll call vote. Mr. Metcher. Opening the hearing. Opening the hearing? Yes. How about you? Yes. Ms. Leo Vasquez is a yes. Ms. Lieberman? Yes. Mr. Foster? No, uh, a yes. <laughs> Mr. De La Torre has left the dais for a moment. Mr. King? Yes. I'm a yes. So of the six members on the dais, there, that's a, a, a unanimous decision, six to zero, to open this hearing. We see no one in the audience to address the board. I will entertain a motion to close this hearing. Moved by Maria to close the hearing, seconded by Lori. This is also a roll call vote. Mr. Metcher? Yes. Ms. Leon Vasquez? Yes. Ms. Lieberman? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Thank you. Again, um, Mr. De La Torre is not on the dais. Mr. King? Yes. And I'm a yes. It's a six to zero yes. 
Um, friends that know, I just would draw your attention, no action is necessary to the informational items that are before us this evening, A, B, C, and D, items 10 A, B, C, and D. There are no general public comments for us this evening and there are no board member items. Are there any comments from members of the board? Lori. Uh, I just wanna comment, especially since the theme of the night was um, in part music and arts. I went last weekend to both the orchestra concert on a Friday night and the choir concert on um, Saturday night at Samo High and they were just both extraordinary. And in particular, the orchestra concert, which was um, dedicated, it was animated feature night and they had this cool, they'd run the piece of the movie in the background with no sound and then you'd see the orchestra play. It was, it, it was really fascinating, fun, and it was also um, to our theme tonight of the mariachi music there it was they did have composers who are have from different backgrounds there were uh, coco was one of the, was one of my favorite ones maybe because it was one of the ones i know the music from <laughs> but it was it, it was it, i mean i was watching it and was aware that either they did it just because it was natural or they were aware that they were considering different cultures, our social justice standards, all of that. And I, I, so I, I um, it was very clear and it was, I felt terrific about it. Um, so I just wanted to say that I know everybody here knows how incredibly great our music department is throughout the district, but every time I go to anything, it's just mind blowing. I mean, <laughs> so. Thank you, Lori. Maria. And my only other piece, and I agree with you, I mean, if, if it, our kids learn, learn how to read music, so they're professionals. So whatever piece of music you put in front of them, by the time they're high school, they know how to read this stuff and they can play along with it. So, I mean, there's no doubt about that. But one of the pieces we're talking about, you bringing on, and it just brought to mention um, the, the Nutcracker. Well, I know this summer at the Hollywood Bowl, the ballet from Cuba was supposed to be here in the summer to perform the Nutcracker. And for some reason, I've always the visas and Trump trumped it. So <laughs> they, didn't, they weren't able to come in. He trumped it. So anyway, um, we're hoping that maybe there's something that if they can't come here. Maybe we can go see them. Maybe we can have their summer that we can, because I know they have a lot of culture out there. And it would be great to take you know, some students out there and to take a tour before it all kind of start. I don't know if it's crum will crumble. I don't know. But at least now, maybe take a tour to Cuba in the next year or so. Thank so Dr. Mora. Mora, if you can, if you can do the, the magic, and I'll do some research too, so maybe we can do that. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Um, colleagues, th that brings us to the conclusion of our agenda for this evening. We will reconvene in Malibu on November 1st. This evening, we will adjourn our meeting in the memory of Beverly Waters. Beverly is, excuse me, was a retired longtime vice principal of Samo High. She passed away earlier this month at home at the age of 93, surrounded by her family. Our former Ed Services colleague, Peggy Harris, remembered Bev as a consummate educator who dedicated her life to students. She deeply loved Santa Monica High School and worked tirelessly to make it a place of excellence. A meticulous woman with a commanding presence, Bev was known for her quick mind, direct talk, and extraordinary organizational skills all of which she unashamedly mobilized on behalf of SAMO every day of her tenure as vice principal. Bev left a scholarship endowment for a SAMO High senior who is interested in going into the field of education. Tonight we close our meeting in her memory. <laughs>